Ah, digital contesting. Well, I kind of got into digital contesting, find it a lot of fun. Uh, I was into RIDI contesting for quite a while, but RIDI kind of seems to be slowly falling by the wayside. My apologies to the RIDI operators if you take offense at that. But any D expedition now pretty much doesn't carry RIDI stuff with them. It's now FT4 and FT8. And contesting, talk about contesting in general. It's generally about rate. He who has the fastest rate usually wins. So there are kind of four popular modes of contesting, and we can see how the rate is influenced by the operator. Sideband and CW. You go faster if you shorten time between the CQs. You send faster. You shorten your message. Improve your accuracy. Get it right the first time. And kind of the bottom line is to keep a signal on the air. Really, shorten time between QSOs. You work more. Sending faster doesn't work because it takes the same amount of time to send a 20-letter me message pretty much because really is a fixed mode. But you can shorten the message, improve the accuracy, and again, keep a signal on the air. Now, when you go to the FT4 modes, modes, you can't shorten the time between the CQs. You can't send faster. You can't shorten your message. And get, improve your accuracy. Get it right the first time. Accuracy is not the problem with FT4 and FT8. But keep a signal on the air is the one thing that all the modes have in common. Error rates. CW is sideband and ready. There's two main sources of errors, busted calls and not in logs. And there are probably more busted calls and not in logs. FT error rates, very few busted calls. So few I no longer use super check partial when I operate FT contests. But extreme care must be taken to avoid over 5% not in logs. Once you keep a signal on the air, your ability to make more QSOs by speeding up the process is not there. It takes 15 seconds to send or receive an FT8 transmission, whether it's four characters or 13 characters long. It takes seven and a half seconds to send or receive an FT4 transmission, whether it's four carriers, characters or 13 characters long. So your first objective in FT contesting is to utilize every 15 second time period. You're either calling CQ or working another station. Keep a signal on the air. And the second objective is to better utilize each time period by eliminating repeats and loops. Among your decisions, is it better to call CQ or is it better to call another station? If you call another station and he keeps repeating your report, Signify he didn't receive my report. How long do you put up with the cycle before you move on? Now, all the screenshots shots you're going to see are from the 24106 version of WSJT Improved Plus. There's another version that just came out yesterday, but I'd already done this one, so I didn't want to update any of the screens. A word on programs. I've only used WSJT for my contest work, and I use it to feed N1MM for analysis and logging. Specifically, I use WSJTX Improved, and there's a website where you can find it. And if you join the group's IO mailing list for that, you'll get a notice when each version is issued and what changes were incorporated. Even though they're advertised as alpha software, I found them to be pretty robust and if a big bug is found, UE DG2 YCB has been very receptive to fixing it right away. And he's also been very receptive to my suggestions for enhancements. So whatever version of WSJT you are now using, uh, what I'm gonna show you may or may not be present there, but I've never used MSHV, JTDX, JS Caller, WSJT-Z, so I won't comment on any of those. Setup. Just as in any contest, there's a certain amount of work to do in getting ready for the contest. The all dot text should be erased or renamed. You want one for just the contest info. 
And because of its effect on the color coding in WSJT, you want to erase or, or rename the WSJT log.adi file. Otherwise, your color coding will come out wrong. And the Cabrillo log should also be reset. One of the things I always do in the mode is I like to check the hide the call signs here. Hide call, hide call signs work before on band. Now, it doesn't really do what it says because it that's only what you work today. In the latest version, I understand hide, hide call signs work before on band today or yesterday. So now you can use it on a contest. So automatically any call sign that you worked say on 20 meter FT yesterday, won't show up as a call sign to work today. Typical for many contests on the setup. And for a test with states, I will check some of the state boxes. Transmit macros. The only transmit macro that I'm aware of is a DX dollar sign. If you use it here, as you can see down below, it will send whatever call is on the DX call line. And the first one, I'm asking the DX to QSY to 28090. I can't make the message any longer or any more cryptic without it being too long to be sent. For a grid scare con square contest, I also have a DX dollar sign grid message. Sometimes when you put it out, it actually works and you the guy comes back with this grid. Reporting, even though this is a contest, I found it better to log everything manually. First contest, I used WSJT automatically. After the contest, I went through and found about 70 QSOs that I had worked that the program decided I didn't work or in any case did not log them. Ever since then, I've been very shy about the log automatically, so I don't use it. I prefer the WSJTX improved default coloring. You can see they're kind of more muted than the regular WSJT coloring. I also want to highlight messages that end with W with 73 or RR73 here. So that box is also checked. Special operating activity. The specific contests listed, clicking on the button load set contest file. If you unclick the CQ with individual contest name button, some contests still will still send CQ with the contest name. Field day will send CQ field day. FT roundup C2RU. Sometimes it sends tests. But if you check here and put a name in, that's what's going to be over, that's going to override and it's going to send whatever is in that name. I don't use filters in a contest, uh, so I haven't really filled anything out on this thing. Time setting. One of the first and most important things to do is set your time. FT8 requires a time accuracy of plus or minus two seconds. FT4 is plus or minus one second. If a station is outside that tolerance, he may still decode, but you will start losing some decodes if your time isn't within those tolerances. There are many programs available that do the time setting. Here are a couple of suggestions, Mindberg, Thinkman, or you can do it through Windows, Time and Language Sync Now. Calling CQ, find a clear frequency and call CQ. A left to mouse click, establishes your receive frequency. A right mouse click establishes your transmit frequency. And you notice I hit it for the empty spot here for my transmit frequency. Calling CQ. You have this little box down here where you can choose the station, the WSJT, will put into its auto sequence queue. 
particularly on FT4, you want to use the auto sequence queue. None will not put any station into the queue. You have to do it manually. First, we'll put the first replying station into the queue. Whoever it is, whatever he's sending, whether he's sending the TX1 or the TX2 message. Max distance will put the furthest distance station into the queue. And the computer computes the distance between your grid and his. If he didn't send a grid, his distance is zero. So if you use max distance, you've automatically discriminated against anybody that sends a TX2 message. Max DB will put the strongest station into the queue, which is good at the start of contest because you want to work as many guys as quickly without repeats as you can. Minimum DB will put the weakest station into the queue. Haven't found much of a use for that. Now, calling CQ. If, if you, this isn't calling CQ necessarily on this page, but if you right click the enable transmit, it turns orange. Now people call CQ, whoever meets the condition that you've said, like max distance, there may be 10 stations calling CQ. The one that's a max distance will now automatically go into the auto sequence to be worked. That's a nice new feature that uh, help, helps when you're busy, particularly working with your SO2R when you're busy on the other entry window. If you have CQ none set, you have to select the station. I always have to double click on call sets, transmit enable, so I can check what I want. And you have four seconds on FT8 and one second on FT4 to select the station you want. That's why I'm saying on FT4, you want to use the auto sequence routine as much as you can. I'm just not quick enough to have all the decodes done and choose who I want and get it in that one second. If you choose CQ max distance, the station starting with the 2ATX2 message, no grid, gets a distance of zero. So if we're using grid squares as molts, scoring based on distance, or grid squares as a required part of the exchange, I'll generally use max distance the entire contest. Chaining stations. I call CQ on FT8, get three answers. CQ set to max DB, so the strongest station goes into the automatic sequence. You work them, and now it's time. It, let me turn my phone off. You work them, and it's time to select the second station. At the 10... As you're sending the RR73 to the first station, at the 10 second mark, you double click this next station. Much earlier, and you take a chance on disrupting the first station's RR73, which means he may ask for a repeat, eating another 30 seconds. Time efficiency. On FT4, you double click the second station at about the five second mark. So you don't have to wait until the message is done before you change to the, to, the, to the next station. But if you do it to it too early, then you're gonna corrupt your RR73 message and you may have to do another repeat. Chaining stations again, unless one of the stations calls again, I don't find it fruitful to go more than three st stations deep off a of CQ. Even if seven stations call, after you work a couple, the others will be off working someone else. Again, if you right click the enable transmit button, whoever calls CQ that fits your condition down here will go into the auto sequence. Now, another way to cut down what you're looking at over here is uh, this for this one, I checked the uh, CQ. Uh, we'll see it in a moment. Um, just to show, I only show CQs 
And I also get 73s and RR73s. Logging, I always prompt to log the QSO. I found there are too many other things going on. If I don't prompt and perform it, a station may not log. And if I don't catch it at the time, I never catch it. I also log through NM1, N1MM. I know others that log through DX log. Better ID of molts. I get a score computation. Better identification of dupes, especially for SO2R. I can feed the online scoreboards. Better identification of molts needed on other bands. Interfaces to Telnet. And I can see in the log that, that the station is there in the log. Logging through N1MM or DX log can be tricky to set up. So I suggest you do it well before the contest you wish to work. Once set up, it's pretty bulletproof, but you may find it tricky to do the first time. Another benefit of confirmed logging, if there's any missing info, usually this is the line, these three bits of info are what you need. Sometimes down here, uh, if it's left something like Roundup, you can still fill it in before the station is logged. And I position this window so that this OK button is right on top of the Enable Transmit button. So it's two clicks without a mouse movement, and I'm on to the next station. To set up for a contest, first you should update your CTY file. It's the same CTY file. Click here and it downloads it from uh, the 81C website and you're good to go. And while you're at it, update the CTY file in your logger. And WSJT improved recently introduced their version of a call history file. They call it call three text. There are two available, one for EME and the other for terrestrial. I use a terrestrial and update it before every contest. I also update the call history file in my logger. As of today, call three files do not contain states or provinces. So it's not good for a contest like the Roundup if you're gonna use it to detect states. Set up your color codes for WSJT. This is your first line of multiplier detection for the contest. For instance, if grid squares per band are molts, you wanna check new grid on band and turn the others off. If DXCC country once per contest is a molt, you'd want to check new DXCC. And again, turn the others off. Multipliers. Use a multiplier detection in the logging program. You can also connect N1MM Plus to Telnet, and the available molts and queues window will show you new molts. Since everyone is classified as single op assisted in an FT contest, there's no prohibition against using the RBN system for molts. Oftentimes, Telnet shows a molt on a band that I'm calling CQ on. I don't know he's there because he doesn't print on my screen. Rotate the antenna or change the time slice, and he's an easy QSO. Note that Telnet does not tell you what time slice he may be on. Here's a program tip. Trip to toggle the contest mode. Sometimes, particularly like a VHF contest, you may need to toggle out of contest mode to make a particular QSO. To do so, you can right-click the H key. This will toggle you into and out of the contest mode. If you're chasing somebody foxhound, it will also toggle you into and out of the hound mode. On FT4, there is a button on the entry window for best S&B. Don't bother clicking it, it doesn't do anything. If you right click the transmit even first button here, it will gray out as you can see here. You now can't change the time slice on this entry window unless you first clear that grain by right-clicking the FT8 button. 
So if you're operating SO2R, one of the requirements is you can't transmit two signals at the same time. So if one of these is white, the other one's uh, filled in for blue and you freeze both of them. And now neither one will change until you allow the change by clicking on, right clicking the FT8. Here's the program chip on the CQ73 checkbox. It will show you only stations calling CQ, or if you check the box under colors, highlight messages containing 73 or RR73, it will show CQ73 and RR73 stations. If you choose this option, all the other traffic you can usually see in the all.txt file will not be there. What you see in the band activity window will be it. Because a lot of times there's a lot of other traffic in here that'll be white because it's not an RR73 or a CQ. Many station, many times calling a station like this guy with the RR73 will produce an immediate QSO as you were the only station calling. Program tips. Frequency list in a contest when I will be spending most of the time off the waterhole frequencies. Now, somebody asked, what's the waterhole frequency? 074, 136, 074, 100. That's where all the animals gather to play. And I found it's better to eliminate the preferred frequency asterisk. For the FT Roundup, for example, I eliminate all the asterisks. Otherwise, the program keeps pulling me, pulling me back to the, to the waterhole frequencies. Program tips, broken QSOs. You've seen it before. You call CQ, someone calls you, you send the report, they send the report, you send RR73, they send the report, you send RR73, they send the report, and so on. You're locked in a loop, some of which seemingly go on forever. I use a rule of three. They get three chances to hear me and often I will change my transmit frequency for the third chance. If they go, don't hear me, I call CQ and go on and I don't log them. What do I do if I get an RR73 from them later? I log them. That RR73 tells me they got the report and the QSO is good because I know they got my report. I've seen as much as five or six minutes after the original looping and received an RR73. Program chips, replying station not going into auto sequence. Uh, this has been come up and it appears to be a bug or an unexplained, unexplained process in WSJT that causes a station that replies to you not going into the auto sequence queue. You're calling CQ, one guy calls you, and then you call CQ again. Oftentimes he'll call you again and you call CQ again. The solu only solution I found is to double click the call and then it will go into the queue. Why this happens, I don't know. It happened maybe five to six times out of the 1300 QSOs when I was in HQ9 recently. And there've been several guys that have reported this on the WSJT and the programmers can't find any reason why this happens. Doesn't happen often, but it does happen if you're not paying attention, uh, you can miss a good cue. Here's another program tick, tip. If you like the dark style, that's available. If you like an alternate layout with a much bigger band activity window, that's available. FT contests. This is a rundown of the FT contests for the rest of the year. Uh, I enjoy the RSGB ones. They're an hour and a half long. And for this year, you can now make 10 and 15 meter QSOs for the contest. So you can do 10, 10 through 80. Uh, last year, it was limited to 20 through 80. So even on the East Coast US, it was basically a 20 meter contest. 
the activity day. I uh, it's either 12 or 24 hours long, I don't remember which. Good European activity. Uh you can see the other ones that are available here. Now, one more that's come up lately is, is there's an FT4 sprint weekly every Friday, 0100 to 0130 UTC. Uh, we've been running these now for, I guess, five or six months. And we get anywhere from 15 to about 25 participants. Uh, it's half hour long. The bands are still open for DX. It's a fun time if you want to get on and just play around with FT4. But we welcome anybody that wants to join us. Uh, there's a place on 3830 to report your score. No logs are sent anywhere. You just go on 3830 and report your score. I know we have one Ontarian that is frequently on. But if we get a couple more, it's always appreciated. And here's an SO2R screen display that I use for my SO2R operations. Here's my information. You can reach me, email if any if you have any questions I can answer why I do this or why I do that. Uh, but pretty much that's an overview of using the programs for contesting or even just general uh, DXing with it. Uh, if anybody has any questions, please, please feel free. That's great. Thanks very much, uh, Dennis. Okay, there's got some questions here. I think you already answered this. But you said what version of, S of SJTX you're referring to in the presentation. I guess not too many people know what that improved version is actually talking about, so you may have confused people there. Uh, the, the improved version has a number of cutting edge things. A lot of them get tried out there before they get rolled into WSJT. Uh, WSJT just did release a new version, but there've been other, several enhancements to the improved since that new version came out for WSJT. And the improved also has several things. If you're into EME, they have several enhancements that just helped EMA operators. Uh, I'm not into EME, but if you are, you, you definitely want to use the improved version. Okay. I've never used the improved version. I'm, I mean, I'm familiar with it, but I just never have actually done that. Now, we don't have any other questions, but I know that uh, Joseph B 3 jkt wanted to say something about uh, the wide graph uh, window. Uh, Joseph, you might as well make that comment now. Uh, thank you very, thank you very much, Ron. Uh, Dennis, if you could please go back to the slide where you showed the wide graph. I have a couple of comments to make. Um, I've not done any FT4 uh, or FT8 contests other than field day, uh, but I've done a lot of FT8 and FT4 quota. Um, and a common issue that I see, especially with newer operators, it's not to say that it applies to everybody here, but it certainly applies to a lot of other operators, is that they'll set up the uh, bandwidth of the wide graph window incorrectly. And if you read the WSJTX manual, this does indeed affect the decode bandwidth. So uh, on the bottom control, as you can see, it says start 200 hertz. Um, it just happened last night that I worked somebody whose radio was slightly off frequency from mine. And on their radio, their transmit frequency was exactly 200 hertz. But uh, when I received it, that was at 193. Um, so if you set the start to 200, you may not decode the station that's transmitting at 193. Um, so in my experience, it's important to set the start frequency to 100 hertz uh, because you can't transmit below 200, but if somebody's radio is slightly off, it's important to be able to decode them if they're calling you. Um, also, more importantly, the top end of the, of the frequency in the wide graph window, uh, of course, also does affect the decoder. Uh, by default, WSJTX sends, sets it to uh, 2200 hertz. But of course, we know that the band pass for FT8 is 3000 hertz. So it's important uh, per the manual that you set uh, the wide graph window appropriately wide using by dragging the window wider or narrower, and also by adjusting the bins per pixel adjustment such that you can see 
uh, 3000, the 3000 hertz marker at the top, uh, the frequency marker at the top of the window, or further. Um, I personally set mine uh, between uh, 3000 and 3200, somewhere depending on the, the system that I'm using. And um, you can see this often uh, for newer operators where you'll call them, let's say you're transmitting where uh, this transmit slice is at uh, 2600 hertz or so. And you could call and call and call a new, uh, you know, somebody who has their software set up incorrectly, and they'll never hear you. But the first time you slide down anywhere below, let's say, 2,000, um, they'll hear you and they'll give you like a plus 25 or something because, you know, you're running enough power to get that report. And uh, that's simply a matter of their decoder is set up incorrectly. So that's always something to watch out for. Um, an example of this was one alpha zero Charlie, where the photo that they posted to dxworld.net um, had their decode window set incorrectly, and uh, one alpha zero Charlie was not hearing any of their callers above 2200 hertz. Um, so if you uh, caught this like I did, uh, you were able to work one alpha zero Charlie relatively easily by being sure that you called them on a lower frequency than 2200 hertz. And you could also notice, as I did, that um, the band pass was very busy above 2200, but not busy between 1000 and 2200, where they were hearing their callers. Um, so this is just something to watch out for that's very important um, uh, in, the, in the decoder. Um, you can check this all out in the manual. I believe it's section 6.4. And um, that's what I wanted to say. The other thing is quickly about uh, fake it and uh, grid control. Uh, it's 500 hertz steps. It, it, the idea is to keep your harmonics uh, within, uh, sorry, to keep the harmonics outside of the 3000 hertz transmit window. And there are operators in my area who are not using this and it, it does affect my receive. Um, so I just wanted to keep in mind that uh, if you can use rig control uh, to uh, make sure that your transmit audio is centered, uh, it'll step your rig frequency on transmit. Uh, so that you're not transmitting any harmonics if your ALC should be set incorrectly. So, okay, thanks, thanks uh, Joseph. Much. Just going on to another, I don't know if you wanted to respond to any of that, Dennis. Uh, well, you, I don't think you can see it on my slide, but I do have the window going out on over 3,000. I think I cut off at 3,000. Okay. Perfect. The Another question from Bob actually kind of touched on something I was wondering about. I know you don't use MSHV and stuff like that. With Bob, Bob uh, VA3RKM asks, what is your opinion on multiple multiple answer software? Ah, you mean MSHV? Well, yeah, I was kind of wondering. I mean, this. Uh, I mean, this is the context. I'm interested here in the context. Contest is uh, is there a technical reason or is there a contest rule reason? Ah, okay. Uh, it's a contest rule reason. Right now, WSJT or any of the others, uh, they say when you do a multi-type tasking or, or a multi-audio frequency transmission, uh, they're not clean enough and it produces, uh, I, I'm probably going to say intermod on the band, uh, that they banned it from contest the contesting. You don't see anybody using MSHV for multi-streaming, working two or two people at a time in contests because they say it's not allowed. Okay. I mean, that's fair enough. Um, I was just kind of curious about that. And uh, I have one other question. It's just the uh, one on uh, procedure. Do you ever concern yourself, like when you pick a frequency to say CQ on, um, and there's somebody else on the same frequency, but the opposite period. Do you normally consider that to be okay or not okay? You're you're both on the same frequency, but on different time slices? That's correct. The reason I ask is sometimes people will call you on your frequency. Yes. Uh, I, I My opinion, that's okay. Now, that's an also another reason why I never call anybody on their own frequency. Uh, if, if, it's, if it's a good DX station and I try him three or four times, then I may try him on his own frequency. But after I've tried other frequencies to get through other open frequencies that I can see. And a lot of times, if it's again, if it's good DX, I will pause a cycle and make sure where the hole is and go into that hole and try to work the guy. 
Okay. Understood. Um, I don't see any other questions. Is there anybody else who has one? No? Okay. Well, Dennis, what can I say? I thank you very much for uh, joining us today and uh, talking about digital contesting. And uh, that was actually uh, actually kind of interesting. You're talking about all the features in WSJTX I've never even looked at, let alone used, because uh, I've never actually done it myself. But uh, that's kind of interesting. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, and actually, this brings us uh, to the end 